This is day 10 of reading Revelation. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world now belongs to our Lord and to his anointed, and he will reign forever and ever. The twenty-four elders who sat on their thrones before God prostrated themselves and worshipped God and said, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who are and who were, for you have assumed your great power and have established your reign. The nations raged, but your wrath has come, and the time for the dead to be judged, and to recompense your servants, the prophets, and the holy ones, and those who fear your name, the small and the great alike, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant could be seen in the temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a violent hailstorm. A great sign appeared in the sky, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was with child and wailed aloud in pain as she labored to give birth. Then another sign appeared in the sky. It was a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on its heads were seven diadems. Its tail swept away a third of the stars in the sky and hurled them down to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman about to give birth, to devour her child when she gave birth. She gave birth to a son, a male child, destined to rule all the nations with an iron rod. Her child was caught up to God and his throne. The woman herself fled into the desert, where she had a place prepared by God, that there she might be taken care of for twelve hundred and sixty days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels battled against the dragon. The dragon and its angels fought back, but they did not prevail, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The huge dragon, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world, was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with it. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have salvation and power come, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his anointed, for the accuser of our brothers is cast out, who accuses them before our God day and night. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Love for life did not deter them from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great fury, for he knows he has but a short time. When the dragon saw that it had been thrown down to the earth, it pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she could fly to her place in the desert, where, far from the serpent, she was taken care of for a year, two years, and a half year. The serpent, however, spewed a torrent of water out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the current. But the earth helped the woman and opened its mouth and swallowed the flood that the dragon spewed out of its mouth. Then the dragon became angry with the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commandments and bear witness to Jesus. It took its position on the sand of the sea. I can't resist beginning this section by asking whether the line near the beginning of this passage sounded familiar to you. The kingdom of the world now belongs to our Lord and to his anointed, and he will reign forever and ever. You might find it a little more familiar if you think of it in the King James Version. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. I, for one, heard the Messiah in my head for days after I read this originally. Amazing where the sources are for some of the things that are the most beloved in Christian tradition. Here's one that comes from the depths of the weirdness of, of Revelation, nonetheless it is sung by all sorts of very nice, proper suburban people every year at Christmas. In any event, with that as an opener, we have another vision of heavenly glory another little nugget to get us through another hard part of the story, I think. Another reminder that whatever chaos and 
awfulness may be happening in the world or anywhere, worship and serenity continue to reign in heaven. That ought to give us some strength to make it through the difficulties that we face, to say nothing of the much more bizarre ones that we read about in, in Revelation. Because having only just gotten done with that vision, we move right on to war in heaven. We have a vision of, of good and evil here. And somehow they seem both to begin in heaven. They seem both to have been elements of the, the, the retinue of God. That, I think, is important because it means that evil in general is a rebellion against God and not some sort of Manichaean separate entity. That was a, a fairly technical way of, of talking about good and evil. You may know that the Manichees, who were a popular competitor religion for Christianity early in its history, believed that there were two completely separate forces, one good and one evil. That's not the Christian view. The Christian view is that everything is somehow uh, somehow issues from the creative power of God and that evil is somehow a rebellion against that. Nonetheless, it is something that uh, had its origins in some way with God around the surrounding the throne of God. So somehow a message was misinterpreted a message came to think of itself as being of equal value to the one who sent it, and war in heaven is the result. This, I think, should make us stop for a minute and think about what our own sin is. That, in fact, it is a rebellion against God. It is a way in which we try to distance ourselves from the purposes and perfection of God, usually for reasons that don't have a whole lot of lasting value. How much does envy really do us? How much good does envy really do us in the long run? How much good does anger do us when we hold on to it? It doesn't. It eats us up. In the end, it, it lives rent-free in our heads, and those at whom we are angry often don't even know it. So this image of rebellion rather than independent force, I think, should be very comforting and encouraging to us. That in fact, we're not fighting against something that has its own power. Rather, it's an illusion, a delusion, that draws us away from the goodness of God. And if we will only see that, it may seem much less like a heavy lift to return to God and to the way that God would have us follow. Then we have these strange images of the woman and the child and the red dragon. The woman and the child, it seems, are pretty easily mapped back onto Mary and Jesus, or maybe onto Eve and all of humanity. But I think they could just as well be interpreted as being creation and destruction, or creative power and destructive power, birth and death. In any event, it seems that whatever is trying to produce, whatever is trying to uh, enrich the world, whatever is trying to live out the purposes of God is uh, being fought by the, that element that seeks to frustrate the purposes of God frustrate the bringing of grace, love, and mercy into the world. This also should perhaps give us a little bit of comfort because it seems that this is a pretty good metaphor for our own internal struggles. We know what the good is and we know what evil is and we struggle internally with what we're going to do. Here we see that that inner struggle within each one of us is also a cosmic struggle. That, in fact, the whole of creation must fight against the powers of death, the powers of darkness and destruction, just as much as each one of us does. So we are not fighting alone. We're not fighting a battle that has anything to do just with us, but rather is part of the much larger drama that is playing out in the universe as the purposes of God are gradually winning. We as Christians, we as faithful people, 
must believe, do believe, that in the end, God wins. Oh, yeah.